I keep picturing it over and over in the pitch black of solitary confinement. With my arms and legs strapped down and my head taped in place so I can't move or barely even breathe. I keep seeing me pushing Tobio off the cliff. Him in the air reaching and ricocheting off the cliff. Hitting the sand. People circling his crooked body. The grunion coming from the ocean. K crying in his hands. Every time I picture it a worse feeling goes in my stomach. Like my whole body is unbalanced or when you drop straight down in your roller coaster cart and everybody has their hands up screaming. Except. For me there is no end of the ride where I can get off and just sit on an empty bench with my soda. Watching people. Cause what if I was wrong about Tobio? What if the whole time he wasn't trying to hurt K? He just loved him. Same as me. What if that's the reason he was always wandering around alone in the middle of the night like he was depressed? And what if K actually loves him back and I got in the way of people's fate? That doesn't make sense though. Cause he kept telling me that K thought he was better and how he would use his gun on him. Plus K likes me. He even said it at Torrey Pines Beach while we sat together on his special rock and watched the sunset color spread over the ocean. They put me at Horizons after my mom died cause they said I had post-traumatic stress. They believe it was the reason I was always tired and confused and bad to myself. But right now it's even worse. I can't think. I just stare at the total darkness in front of me. Which feels like being inside a black hole or if your boat drifted into the Bermuda Triangle. Solitary confinement is like you don't exist. If I had my philosophy of life book and a pen. I'd try to write about what happened on the cliff and how maybe now I understand why some people have to be put in jail. They've shown they are capable of crossing a line. Like pushing another person off a cliff and maybe it wasn't even for the right reasons. Which shows you their judgment and what if they did it again. But I can't write anything cause the police didn't put my book with me. That's the first thing I checked when I woke up in this blackness. I tried to reach but my arms were strapped too tight. My whole body ached after I just barely shifted. Parts I'd never even thought about. Like in between my fingers and behind my knees. The police must have pounded at me with their billy clubs when they loaded me into the back of the squad car and drove me to prison. They probably thought I was evil for what I did to my best friend. Everybody probably did. Even Kay. But they didn't know Tobio. They never heard him talk about rich people. Especially girls. They've never seen his gun or how he made a throat slashing sign at Kay. How he'd stand there staring at Kay's tent in the middle of the night when he was sleeping. They'd think different if they knew. I wake up and try to reach out my hand again to feel for my philosophy of life book because I need it. But I still can't move. The straps feel even tighter. My breaths barely have room and it's still the blackest black you could ever picture. Like everything got burned up. I keep thinking if this is the form of torture that happens in solitary confinement. Even though you're not supposed to torture people in the United States. And then it really sinks in. Where I am. Strapped in the bed behind bars. Locked up. And all my mom ever said was for me to be a good person. Be polite and respect my elders. I imagine her looking down from heaven right now. Her only son in solitary confinement. Being tortured. I see from her expression how heartbroken she is. Tears running makeup stains down her cheeks. And her chin quivering. Just thinking about my mom crying makes my lungs start going too fast. Like I've just sprinted up the campsite stairs and now I'm gasping for air. My heart's pounding my ribs and it feels like I'm lifting out of my own body. Floating above my prison cot. I'm hovering over the ceiling now. Next to my mom. We're both watching me lay there. Unable to move. Chest going up and down too many times a second. We're cringing at the welts on my arms and legs and face where they clubbed me. This loud ringing noise starts in both my ears. Little gusts of wind pass over my skin like prison ghosts are moving all around my cell. They're waiting for me to die so they can take me to what comes next for a person who pushed his own best friend off a cliff. My mom sobbing and holding them away and saying for me to hurry and remember. Philosophy 1. About being awake. Dear Shoyo. 
You have to always remember the time you escaped Horizons with Tobio and ended up at the street fair downtown. How you and him had to pee so bad you couldn't even stand still. It doesn't seem important just thinking about it. But it goes exactly with what Ukai said about not sleepwalking and knowing you're alive. You and Tobio slipped past the night watch. Remember? You hopped a bus all the way to the gas lamp district and walked through the different booths where bands were playing and people were drinking and laughing and dancing. You drank a huge coke and had to pee but when you looked at the line for the portable bathrooms it stretched all the way around the block and you turned to Tobio and without even saying. You and him walked up the street together looking for a random place. There were people everywhere though. Way more than what's in Fallbrook. You went into a liquor store with elephant tusks over the doorway but it didn't have a bathroom either. Not one you were allowed to use and by that time your bladder was so full it was pounding and you could barely walk. Tobio held onto one of the magazine shelves and said it was the exact same for him. The back door was open a crack and it looked like there was a little yard and Tobio nodded and you peeked at the worker who was busy with a customer and you snuck out there behind Tobio and went to the opposite part of the wall from him and unzipped your zipper and started going. Your eyes making tears cause it was the most relief you've ever felt. On my first day working at the campsite Ukai told me how most people are asleep even when they're awake. We were in the main campsite restrooms. The one right by the coffee shop. Mopping where the toilet had overflowed. Ukai was as old as most people's dad. With smooth blonde hair and tanned skin and he always had a grin on his face like everything was funny. My old counselor, Maria, said people always look twice at Ukai when they passed him because he was so handsome and he resembled a famous actor. Monday through Friday pretty much everybody I know. Show. They walk around half-conscious. I kept mopping the floor and listening. They flip it into autopilot. You understand what I mean by autopilot, right? I nodded, picturing a plane soaring high above the clouds and the pilot just reading a magazine. Even though I knew that wasn't what Ukai was saying. He set his mop back in the bucket and dug his leather surfer hands in the back part of the toilet starting to mess with the pumps and hoses. See. When people grow up and get a job, life gets kind of monotonous and ordinary. All the possibilities dry up. So what do people do? They learn how to shut off their minds. Sleepwalk through the weekdays. Why do you think I started drinking in the first place? For my health? I smiled cause he was smiling. He shook his head and put his right foot up on the toilet seat for leverage. Soon as quitting time came on Friday. I'd hurry off to the bar and wake up on whiskey. A couple years like that and I couldn't wait until weekends anymore. Wednesday seemed close enough. Then Tuesday. He looked at me and shrugged with his eyes then went back to what he was doing. According to my sponsor, Takeda, that kind of thinking is what landed me in rehab. I tried to explain how the only time I saw colors was after I knocked down a couple Jamesons. But he just shook his head and told me I was deceiving myself. He sighed. Takeda is a big, heavy set dude from Iowa, former deacon, used to milk cows and rake hay and drive a tractor in his downtime. The whole thing, only deacon farmer I've ever met. Now, he sails pharmaceuticals out of a white van in La Jolla. Anyway, according to him, drinking is just another form of sleepwalking. All those colors I thought I saw were an optical illusion. Like looking at yourself in a funny mirror at the fair. I pictured my mom drinking wine from a box. How she'd nod off in her rocking chair in front of the flickering TV. Knitting needles loose in her fingers. Like sharpened pencils. Her head leaning forward in super slow mo and her catching it. I stood there mopping the murky water remembering my mom. Point is. Whenever I've got to mess with crap like this. No pun intended. You know what I tell myself? What sir? I say. Alright maybe this isn't your number one choice but at least you're awake enough these days to smell it. He laughed hard and his blonde hair fell in front of his blue eyes. He moved it away with the back of his wrist and stopped doing what he was doing and looked at me. By the way. I don't know if I like you calling me sir. Makes me feel like a venture capitalist. Yes sir, oops, there it is again, I mean, Mr. Ukai, 
He tilted his head and frowned. Mister? We looked at each other. I thought how my mom always said to have respect. He was quiet for a minute. Just frowning at me. Then he coughed into his shoulder. Anyway, sometimes I still dream about it. How warm a swallow of Jameson felt good going down. The sweet aftertaste. The beautiful women who sat beside me on bar stools and told me their lives. He spit into the toilet. Sometimes I wonder, is an occasional glance at a funny mirror really such a bad thing? He shook his head and put the lid of the toilet back on and wiped his hands down the sides of his work shirt and shorts. Promise me you won't tell Takeda what I just said. I won't. Good man. A smile went on his face. Look you get my point right. About handling the different jobs you'll be doing here? Some are a little less glamorous than others. I nodded, thinking how I'd rather do any job, than be stuck inside the faded pea-colored walls of my bedroom at Horizons, where the people constantly watch you and make you do therapy and take medicine. Maybe you are a little rough around the edges like they said, but I'll give you this. You listen, I don't know how it is for anybody else, but listening goes a long way in my book. I put my mop in the bucket and squeezed out the dirty water. What book do you mean? Come again? You said your book. It's just a figure of speech. It's the way I see the world. Everybody has a way they see the world, right? I stayed looking at my mop and didn't say anything. I didn't want Ukai to know I didn't have a book with the way I saw the world. Figuring out a name. Soon as I got off work that night I went to campsite coffee and bought a blank notebook and a special pen from Yachi. I went back to my tent where I was going to live for the whole summer, and stared at the cover for the longest time trying to think. I listened to people talk as they walked along the path outside my tent. Mostly kids. A girl's voice said some girl named Blue looked too skinny and maybe that's why she always went to the bathroom after she ate. Another girl said she bought a big bottle of aloe this year. A little later, a man's voice says, She's not depressed Mary she's insecure there's a difference. A woman's voice answered, she's 16 and she's a girl Ron. What do you expect? Jesus, why do you think I'm taking her to New York? I understand, but until then, their voices trailed off and I looked back at my book and write that second a name popped in my head. Shoyo's Philosophy of Life Book. I laid in my tent that night, on top of my sleeping bag. Writing my first ever philosophy about how people are asleep even when they're awake. And about seeing colors. And being on autopilot. I addressed it to myself like a letter to me. Thinking I could read it later and remember all the important things I learned from Ukai. As a regular person. Outside of horizons. And then. I don't even know why. But I started writing about this time me and Tobio had to run for our lives out of this liquor store downtown. You weren't even close to being done peeing though. When you heard a deep growling sound and when you turned there was a huge pit bull crouched down and showing his teeth. Saliva dripping onto the grass. Do you remember how paralyzed your body got? It was frozen. You couldn't even breathe air into your lungs. Tobio shouted. Come on. You zipped up mid-flow and raced back through the liquor store with the rabies dog chasing you. Barking so loud you couldn't even hear what the liquor store guy was yelling. You and Tobio flew out of the store and up the street not looking back or stopping or saying anything until you were at least 15 blocks away. Then you ducked behind a big black truck and leaned over laughing and trying to catch your breath. Even though it probably doesn't seem like that big of a deal now. To this day, you've never run so fast in your life or laughed so hard. You sat there on the sidewalk next to Tobio bent over laughing. People walking past gave you dirty looks. Maybe it goes exactly with what Ukai said today, that you should always remember how awake you feel when you're running or laughing with Tobio. Or even when you're just cleaning a campsite bathroom as part of your job. You always have to remember how lucky you are to be away from horizons. To be free, alive, and awake enough to smell everything. I can't remember what happened after the grunion came. I don't know if Tobio died when he hit the sand or if Kay understands how I did it for him. Or if anybody saw the police club me and push me in the backseat with handcuffs. 
I have no idea what I thought about as I stared out the window while they drove me here. Either I blacked out or they gave me drugs like the ones I got at Horizons after my mom died and they said I have post-traumatic stress. I've been laying here this whole time. In the dark. Trying to remember the summer and everything that happened before I pushed Tobio off the cliff. Then I could know if I was right. But so much of my mind is missing. The way I feel is missing too. That's why I think they gave me pills. It's the same as after they sat me down and said my mom was gone and gave me drugs that would supposedly make me better. Except I didn't feel better at all. I just got hollow. Like a chocolate bunny in your Easter basket. Which is how I am right now. You know those stories they have about cats coming up to babies' pillows when they're asleep and stealing their breath? That's what it feels like with me. Only the cat that came to my pillow. Left my breathing alone and stole how I feel. What I remember about my mom. All you can do in prison is think. Your mind goes to bad places if you let it think whatever it wants. So you have to picture certain things. Most of the time I try to remember the summer before the Grunion night to decide if I was right about Tobio. But today I've just been laying here picturing things about my mom. How she never looked you in the eyes when she talked to you. She'd stare at the top of your forehead. Or in your hair. Or at something past you. She never picked up the phone. She'd stand there watching it ring. Waiting for the voicemail light to start flashing. This one time we did miniature golf and she hit a hole in one and all the spotlights came on and the workers announced it over the loudspeakers and gave us a bucket of free tokens. How on the ride home? She told me she just aims for the green wall. That was her secret. Nobody else knew to aim for the green wall. Then she called me her good luck charm. I memorized every word of the last letter she wrote me. I remembered how she'd fall asleep in front of the TV and I'd wake her up and take the empty wine glass from her hand and help her to her feet and watch her stagger to her room. Me carrying her glass to the sink staring at the red stain at the bottom and wondering what was going to happen to us. Then me as a little kid waking up and finding her standing over me as I laid in her bed. Looking at me saying, you can still sleep baby mommy's just watching you. My dad coming over and them smoking on the fire escape. Laughing and sitting close. Him staying over. The next morning her dancing to the radio in the kitchen. Making pancakes and bacon. Bringing out our plates. Setting them down. Rubbing his shoulders while he took his first bite and then winking at me. Me standing behind her in court when she got the restraining order. And then later that night how she let him in because he said he was sick. Pulling money from her secret cookbook stash and slipping it into his hand. Them hugging and crying and her telling me to go back to bed cause they were talking. Her on her knees by the bed in her room one morning. Praying. Then when she saw me acting like she wasn't. But mostly I remember every morning before school. How she'd say, hey honey, just as I was walking out the apartment door. And me stopping and turning around and saying, what? and her saying, I love you, and me rolling my eyes. Like I just wanted to hurry up so I didn't miss the bus. I'd start going again and she'd say, hey honey, and I'd say, mom come on, and she'd say, I love you, and I'll pretend I was so annoyed because she was wasting time and I had to go catch the bus. And how secretly it was my favorite part of every day.